Well, good afternoon, everybody. This story actually starts with an Australian research grant, and it could be summarised as a series of rather fortunate accidents because our grant was to look at old brains using uh, this new CT technology. And um, obviously, from the title, uh, we ended up very much at the wrong end of the fish. So this is a um, picture of uh, the Great Barrier Reef. And as you can see, you have the little exposed areas of reef, uh, shallow water, and these deep uh, channels running uh, throughout. And one of the things that's particularly um, prevalent is reefs have an incredible diverse fauna. Uh, they're a biodiversity hotspot, really. And so we've been going back in time and having a look at Australia's first Great Barrier Reef. Uh, we can see here that uh, we've got the remainder of the reefal structure here. This is where one of these big deep channels went through. This is called Bugle Gap. And then we have the shallower areas which represented the small bays, etc., throughout the reef. One of the things to note, though, that in the Devonian reefs weren't made very much of coral. They were mainly made of sponges and algae with just a little bit of uh, solitary coral. And in between the reefs, we have these plains full of what we call the go-go nodules. But they're basically calcium carbonate rock or limestone, which have formed into these nice circular oval structures and if you're really lucky, you'll crack one open and you find a fish. And preservation is absolutely extraordinary at GoGo. Uh, here's our fish's um, head. Uh, that's one jaw. That's the other jaw. So it's kind of been butterflied out. And you have the body and the tail. And as I said, we were particularly looking for heads and brains. So we were very excited on our field trip that on the first day, uh, this is Professor John Long who um, really investigated this site quite thoroughly when he worked here at the Western Australian Museum and is now at the Los Angeles County History Museum and Tim who does all of our CT work in Canberra. And we were very excited because this is Gogonasis. Paleontologists don't have terribly good imagination, so all we did was call it nose from Gogo -go in Latin, so it sounded better. And that's its little nose sticking out of the nodule. And as uh, John points out, our excitement was short-lived because he wanted to find the tail as well. And that was around about the locality that we found it. And John said, no, you'll be right. Just go back and find the tail. And somehow we did. <laughs> so uh, we had a very successful trip. And uh, this was our 2005 trip. And we got nearly 200 kilograms of fossils. Of those, 120 were complete. Uh, which meant we had from the tip of the nose to the tip of the tail. And within that, we got what we thought were probably four new genera never been described before and possibly more species. And one of these was Marta Pisces, or the mother fish. And unfortunately, as with many of these things, we concentrated first on Gogonasis. That was the fish that we thought was going to be the most exciting. And poor old Marta Pisces sat in its nodule for nearly four years before we decided that we'd actually prepare it out. So the first thing you have to do, and this is Gogonasis coming out of the rock, is, um, so there was the nose um, that gave his name. And the fish are put in small, um, weak acid baths. So we're using between, at this point we'd be using around about 10% acetic acid, which is a little bit stronger than vinegar. And at this point we'd probably have um, really reduced the concentration of the acid down to about 6 or 7%. At this point the fish would probably be sitting in acid for about a week at a time. 
uh, at this point it would be several hours at a time. So you have to keep a bit of an eye on them and it takes about six months to get to this point. Because after each time you put your fish in um, acid, you have to take it out, you have to wash it for twice as long as it's been in acid, dry it, put a plastic coating on and that's what's made it nice and shiny so that you don't dissolve away the bone the next time you put it in the acid. And here's Marta Pisces, which didn't look quite as exciting coming out of the acid at all. And we were interested in this little blob here that shouldn't have been there. And um, speaking to other preparators may not have been preserved because usually when you find just a little mass like that, you go, oh, that's a bit of junk, and you scrape it off with a scalpel. So we'll go back, and how do you determine sex in the fossil record? When we think about fossils, really, the majority of time, what you're getting preserved is just the hard parts. So either the skeleton, teeth, scales. And sexual differences or sexual dimorphism, which is a, a notable difference between the male and the female of a species, is not often shown up um, in the skeleton. And really the only... Um, only point sexual dimorphism that you often see in a skeleton is a difference in size. So males tend to be larger than the females in most species. When you're dealing with fossils though, how do you know you've got a male and a female? How and how do you know whether the your size difference is not that you've just got a juvenile and an adult? So it's very difficult to determine. Really, when we're looking at sexual characteristics, we tend to think of it as, as soft parts. So they're very rarely preserved in the fossil record. And skeletally, the males and females may look exactly the same. And this is just a slide to show that, um, you know, with our peacocks, it's very obvious from the plumage which one's the male and which one's the female. But if you just had their skeletons, it would be impossible to tell. Um, the same with um, coloration, and we have a size difference here, but um, again, how would you tell which is the adult? And there are some incident incidences where uh, sexual dimorphism is preserved in the skeleton, um, and this is a very interesting study on some of the dinosaurs where uh, the male has a much a larger crown than the female. Now for a long time these were considered to be two different species. Uh, so rather than a male and a female of the same species. The other thing is that this is a secondary sexual characteristic but it's not part of the reproductive organs. So it tells us a little bit about um, the different sexes but really not a great deal about their reproduction. Uh, because sexual dimorphism just means that the males and the females are different. It doesn't necessarily mean that um, there was internal fertilization. So we're going way back in time here, um, and we're looking at a group called the placoderms. These are the most common uh, fossil fish that we get up at GoGo. -Go. There are no living representatives of this group um, that we know of. And they're particularly good because they fossilize very, very well. The head and the thorax were covered by big bony plates, and that tends to um, mean that there was, you know, at least two thirds of the fish preserved. And our placoderms actually give us um, the oldest evidence of sexual dimorphism in vertebrate animals or animals with backbones. And this goes back to around about 400 million years ago. Uh, this is uh, Campylotus, and he is from the Gogo Formation that also occurs in Scotland. And it was in 1932 that they realised that males had these claspers. And so here's the original drawings. Um, and you can see the claspers here. Now they're preserved because they're encased in a bony skeleton. And they have these very nasty little hooks on the end. 
And so the female has protected herself and she's got a very um, strong scale cover around the vent which we think that these hooks hooked into. We see the same thing with sharks. The males have these clasper organs and um, we do know that they mate through in internal fertilization and have sexual reproduction. But with sexual reproduction, you don't necessarily need internal fertilization. And what we thought was happening with many of our fossils was external fertilization. So eggs are laid outside the body, and then the male comes along and fertilizes them. What our friend from Scotland told us was that some of these ancient fish actually had internal fertilization, which is not quite as primitive and that fertilization actually occurs inside the female. But there's three outcomes from this and it was always assumed that our very ancient fish must have laid eggs. It's the most primitive form and these are the most primitive fish. You can also have um, internal fertilization with the eggs hatching inside the body and a lot of reptiles have that sort of reproduction or the most advanced form where you give birth to live young. And pretty much all of us didn't think that these very primitive fish could do that. Okay, so we're right back down here um, with our placoderms and they really are quite uh, unique. They are the first fish that have jaws, they're the first fish that have pectoral fins and pelvic fins. Um, and so they're really experimenting with becoming what we would think of as a vertebrate, yet they're starting to tell us that they have a very advanced form of reproduction. So getting back, we decided to have a look at what this horrible mess was on our nodule, uh, probably because John and I were bored and thought, but I guess we were procrastinating against something, and we decided that we'd put it under a microscope. And we found that there was all these tiny little bones poking out of the rock. So the first thing that we had to determine then is, is this an embryo or was this its fish's last meal? Because we certainly got evidence in the fossil record uh, with dinosaurs and sharks and even from Gogo where you find the last meal still preserved in their stomach often in their throat because they choked on their last meal. But what intrigued us was this structure here. And at this point, we were very concerned that we were going to be dissolving all these fine bones away. And we were um, dissolving it away in 5% acetic acid in 10 minute baths. So, we have a mineralized umbilical cord that's leaking around. This is one of the plates of the head. This is the lower jaw and that's the upper jaw and they're exactly comparable to the adult. This is the mother's vertebral column around here, one of the backbones. And um, our umbilical cord is snaking under this fin support. We removed a little bit of the umbilical cord and did some scanning electron micrographs of it. And you can actually see that there's uh, the passage through the middle uh, for a blood vessel, so it's highly vascularized. There's these little appendiculae or little projections coming off the side and they increase the surface area of the umbilical cord where the nutrients would have um, come out of uh, to feed the um, young. And we can see again that a very similar uh, reproductive strategy still occurs in today's sharks. At this point we decided that acid baths and um, scanning electron micrographs and things were getting a little bit too destructive for basically the one and only specimen we had of an embryo in the world. 
So we turned to our colleague Tim, who had found the gogonasis. And Tim is a um, mathematician at um, the Department of Physics at ANU and had been building um, CT scanners to actually take scans through rocks for the petroleum industry. And the advantage of Tim's scanning is that it can scan very small things. Uh, so this is the head of a lizard. And unlike a medical CT scanner, it's a specimen that rotates rather than the scanner. So um, what we did was we put our mother fish in there and saw that our umbilical cord actually curves right around and connects uh, a kind of mineralized area which we think may have been a yolk sac um, to the mother and to the embryo. And just because we do, could, uh, Museum of Victoria made a lovely little movie explaining everything in, um, I think, three minutes. Uh, so we had our fish. Um, as you can see, we, we did end up losing the head, uh, which was not so good because that was what our grant was about. And um, we have our little fish. Now, this will come up. Now, this is the three of us presenting this work uh, to the Queen and Prince Philip for the opening of the Royal Society in London. So I got to say male sexual organ to Her Majesty the Queen. <laughs> when you make a discovery like this, I actually, you have to go back and think, is this the only one that we have ever found or have we missed it? And nagging in the back of my mind and in John's was this specimen, which is the same type of fish, a technodont placoderm, and it's the only one that was ever found with scales. And when we found the mother fish in Melbourne, we both kind of, John said, when you go back to Western Australia, pull out Ostratictodus again. And I said, yes. I said, I wonder what those scales really are. And they were, in fact, another three embryos. Uh, and this is what we had seen, uh, these large plates here, which we thought had been um, the, the scales. And they were actually three, three separate embryos. With, again, good, good microscopes, um, which were not available when we first found the tictodont, um, we were able to show that uh, the bone structure is very open weave. Uh, so this is a cheek plate in the embryo, and you can match it to the cheek plate in the adult. Um, this is the big shoulder plate, again, here and here. And this is the one that we had originally mistaken to be a scale. There has been evidence in the fossil record of fossils giving birth to life young, and those scientists had exactly the same uh, problems as we had. Uh, this is a mosasaur, and you've got the little embryo here all curled up. There it is. Uh, you think that it was uh, fairly obvious what this was, but again, these animals were thought to have been cannibalistic. And it wasn't until they found this fossil with um, the embryo actually being born, that it was accepted that this was an evidence of live birth. But what we have is our evidence of live birth in vertebrates nearly 200 million years earlier than the next evidence in the fossil record. So we're really taking things way back in time. We decided then to go and have a look at other placoderms to see whether or not they showed evidence of sexual dimorphism. We were, we were going to milk this for all that we could. Uh, so we went back for some of the specimens and uh, these had been recognised but not identified. So they appeared in earlier pu publications as unknown pelvic elements. Again, we now know that they're um, the male 
claspers. Females don't have them. Now with this group of um, fish, we've got sexual dimorphism. The males have got claspers, the females haven't. We haven't discovered any embryos, so we don't know if they give birth to live young. This is a very large bony plate which covers the whole of the abdominal region. So we think that it's probably highly unlikely that they did. Now this is, um, this is actually our state fossil emblem. This is uh, Magnamaraspis uh, and he's on view upstairs. And they belong to a group of placoderms called the Arthrodires. And they're the most common sort of placoderm that you get at GoGo -Go, or pretty much around the world. Okay, they are the sardines of the placoderm world. And they've been known since uh, the mid 1800s. And this is Cacostius who's from the old red sandstone in Scotland. And as you can see, nice pelvic girdle, no evidence of claspers. Again, this is one of the gogo -go fish and it has all of these tiny little bones inside it. Now this was um, recovered in the 1960s by Harry Toombs from the British Museum. And like many um, uh, things that were happening at that time, uh, large numbers of British scientists were coming out to Australia and taking the fossils and they were going back to the British Museum for preparation and for work and study. And it was actually quite a, a, a good thing. Um, a number of Australian scientists were taken over there and trained. Uh, so it was, it was beneficial. But um, Kim Dennis Bryan described this fish during the 1980s and came to the conclusion that she thought that this probably was an embryo but there was no record whatsoever of sexual dimorphism in this group of fish and Cacostius was so well known from the old red sandstone they had nearly 60 specimens and none of them showed any degree of uh, sexual dimorphism. So. Again, we went back to our collections um, and this fossil was described in 2003 and we have the pelvic girdle here with all of the little pelvic fin rays and then this very strange element here with a long rod and it had little hooks on the end. So that's the pelvic girdle and here's the clasper. So we have the first male Arthrodia placoderm uh, discovered in the Western Australian Museum collections. We were also able to uh, see that the pelvis of the female looked quite different and she has a much smaller little element here. And we were also able to say then that it was most likely that these little bones represented two embryos. Now one of the e pieces of evidence that was put forward that they had to be um, food was this open weave bone. Uh, and they said that that had to be because the stomach acids were dissolving the bone away. But we now know, looking at the technodonts, that it's actually a juvenile characteristic. The bone doesn't fully develop um, until quite late. So this, is, um, this one takes rather a, a while to start, I'm afraid. But um, one of the things, though, that we're starting to get with these studies is now an idea of sexual behaviour. If you have a male fish and a female fish and your male wants to mate with you, you have to know that that's what he wants to do and that he doesn't want to actually come and eat you, which is so. We've got the idea that these animals must have had some quite complex behaviours. The other thing is there must have been differences where the populations live. How can we get these great collections where there's only females and only have one or two males? So we think the females probably schooled and then that there were solitary males that would just come in to mate. The other thing which is probably the most uh, remarkable and what you tend not to think about too much is that that umbilical cord is soft tissue. And I said earlier on that soft tissue doesn't fossilise well. So how is this occurring? 
So again, we started to have a look at our preparation techniques and uh, within the ske skeleton there, we found these little rows of muscle tissue. And so these um, are transverse fibers. These are your longitudinal muscle fibers. So they're the ones that uh, if you get a piece of fish and you fill it, they would be the ones that you see. But these ones here, these transverse ones, are the ones that we were interested in because they're the muscles that would have operated that classical organ. So we are now starting to get a really interesting picture. And um, this is probably the story as to how I ended up moving uh, from a geology department into a chemistry department because we wanted to know how the soft bits got hard. How is that soft tissue being preserved? And we discovered that bacteria that you normally think of as being highly destructive in, and breaking things down were actually very, very important to uh, this story. These are some embryos um, done by Hagerborn um, that were found from the Cambrian. And they're preserved. We don't know what they're the embryos of. But we can see that there's a bacterial biofilm covering them. And it's thought that uh, this helps to protect them and also allows for the soft tissue to be replaced before it collapses. We have now quite a lot of muscle in our placoderms. Some of it's beautifully preserved. So here's a nerve fiber uh, running through uh, some muscle fibers. Um, and you can actually see the little bacterial cocci that have been sitting on the top preserved. Another muscle fiber which has been preserved cell by cell. Uh, and a lovely biofilm running in between the two. Now a biofilm is basically a sticky mucousy substance which bacteria produce and covers everything. And it's particularly great at preserving fossil fish because one of the things that happens is that uh, of course often they have a scale cover. Uh, as they decompose the scales all float off in the sea but our bacterial biofilm holds it all together. Also, as things decompose, their pH changes. And then that can cause minerals that are in the ocean to actually precipitate out. And the bacterial biofilm will hold those in place. And once they're there, it allows the replication of the muscle tissue into calcium carbonate or calcium phosphate. The other thing that placoderm armor does um, and this is, the, this is the belly of the fish, is it also helps to hold these muscle fibers in place. It also stops oxygen getting in and breaking it down. And the other thing is it helps stop scavengers getting in and disrupting the muscle tissue. What we did work out was that acid digestion destroys soft tissue. And uh, so probably for the last 40 years, we've been busily dissolving away a large amount of information. So soft tissue may not be quite as rare as we thought. So this occurs um, where we started to have a look at new technologies to have a look at some of these structures um, that don't allow for traditional preparation. And uh, one of the more difficult parts of my job is to travel to the south of France every year <laughs> at the European uh, Synchrotron facility. And um, this is run by uh, Dr. Paul Taffaro, who is also a paleontologist, but also is actually very good as a physicist. And basically, a synchrotron is a particle accelerator. So um, electrons are fired into a booster ring. They're sped up to the speed of light. They're put into the storage ring. And then they're fed off into an uh, optics cabin. There's an experimental uh, room, which is lead-lined because of the radiation. And then we all sit out here, nice and safe, away from everything at a bank of computers and hope that things are going on very nicely in that room. 
It's very black box experimenting. Uh, so then here's our experimental animal. And uh, again, it sits on a, a stage. And basically, you're looking at a very high powered CT scanner. It takes slices. And then through the magic of computers and computer technicians, those slices are all stitched together to make a lovely 3D model. And so this is some work that's been done by Paul Taffaro on some uh, invertebrates or animals without backbones. And this is an ostracod or it's a type of little shellfish. And they're very common and usually only their shells are preserved. And they're around about 0.3 to 3 millimetres long. Sometimes you get a little bit of body preserved inside the shells and sometimes you're really lucky and um, you get everything preserved. So um, what we have here is a living ostracod. Well, let's face it, I'm a biologist, so by the time we finished with it, it wasn't living anymore. Um, but here's our, um, our fossil. So we have our Zenka organs, and the Zenka organs contain giant sperm. We have a female, and we've got the semial receptacles, or where she holds the sperm, and they'll often hold sperm for up to two years. And here's modern female, so very much. And we know that uh, this must have been full of sperm at the time of death because they're expanded, not flat, and we wouldn't see them. So again, here's our, here's our fossil and here's our modern. Um, and this has taken our, our idea of looking at, at sex within fossils back to around about, uh, I think it was about 480 million years. Um, and here you have this giant sperm, uh, there's a modern, and there's fossil. So this is telling us that this group of animals hasn't changed a great deal over a huge amount of time. So then we wanted to have a look and see whether or not synchrotron technology could help us um, identify where some of the soft tissue and muscles were. And we were in a very good position to do that because of the muscle preservation that we've got in our fossils. So they provided a good control or a test case because we we know where the muscle is because it's preserved and then we wanted to have a look and see if there was any telltale signs on the bones that would allow us to reconstruct it for fossils where there is no soft tissue preserved. Now one of the traditional ways we've done that is to look at scarring. And where muscles attach to bone, there's often a muscle scar left. And we predicted that there would be a muscle attachment here based on some scarring. The first thing that we had a look at was in our synchrotron scan was, uh, this is a section and you can see the growth lines. And growth lines on bone have always thought to be like tree rings, nice and circular, appositional growth, layer after layer after layer. What we actually found was that um, they're very, very convoluted. Uh, so that's one growth line, that's another growth line, and you can see them coming through here. Uh, so they're not actually nice straight rings at all. The other thing uh, we saw was that there was this massive thickening on the bone where we predicted the muscle tissue would be attached to. Uh, but there was also another thickening down here, which we hadn't predicted um, as a muscle attachment point. And this is our synchrotron scan, and these are done at submicron levels. And what we hadn't thought about doing before, but what we realised we could do, is this is all the vasculature. So where there's holes in the bone, um, some very clever technician can fill those holes with blood vessels and so we're actually getting an idea of the circulatory system. You can see where those growth rings were, which is this level of the bone, you can see them here. Um, 
the, the blood vessels come up and it's very vascular at the growing site and less so at the areas that aren't growing. And this gives us what that um, convoluted pattern was because the growth plates have to move around the vessels. The other thing we found was muscle attachment fibers. And these are penetrating the layers of the bone. We've got the vascular holes here. And we also even found little dimples on the bone that held the cells that uh, produce these fibers. And these fibers are what uh, tendon will put out to actually stay attached to your bone. So we were able to show in our placoderm that uh, we had one muscle that was predicted. There was one that was completely unpredicted and showed nothing on the outside of the bone. The synchrotron scanning showed that there's a disruption in the cells and um, that it is a muscle attachment point. So now we've actually got the capabilities that in lots of animals where muscle hasn't been preserved, we can put them into one of these scanners and have a look and predict with a reasonable amount of accuracy uh, where muscles would be. And so this is going to be really great for things like giant kangaroos and dinosaurs and um, animals that just aren't here anymore. This is the head of a ratfish or a chimerid uh, that was again done by a colleague, Alan Pridell. And this is a little cautionary tale uh, for paleontologists who tend to fill all spaces with something. The little yellow bit that will um, come into view soon is this animal's brain. That's the brain case, and it will become transparent in a second, and that's its brain. And the little kind of pokey bits out the side here are the spinal nerves. So they're in the right place, so we know that the brain didn't shrink. Okay, so this poor fish had a very small brain compared to its head. But it, was, it does tell us that by filling a place and making an endocast of a, a brain cavity, uh, which a lot of paleontologists and anthropologists do, especially with um, human, uh, may not be as accurate as we first thought. So, synchrotron scanning, it was fantastic. It's in France, there's one in Melbourne now. But how do we see these kind of hidden structures in large fossils? So this is just a little tale, um, and this is work done by Catherine Boisvert from Monash University. And we turn to medical CT scanning. This is um, a rather large fish, two meters, and we wanted to have a look at these fins. And unfortunately, the fish had died and folded up its little fins and gone face down, and we couldn't see them. So we took it to the East Talon Hospital. And as it was a fish, and the patient seemed to think that they needed the CT scanner during office hours, um, it was scanned at 3 a.m. This is the transportation that we thought it deserved. Um, unfortunately, it just went in a standard tabletop truck. Um, but um, this is what we found that when we digitally removed the uh, matrix, you actually get all the bones of the fin. And what was particularly interesting was um, that these aren't little kind of fin bones here, but they're actually bones in a hand. So this fish was well on its way of uh, moving from a aquatic environment onto land. Will CT scanning work on our go-go fish? No. Size matters. Pandarichthys is 2 metres. Gogonasus was 30 centimetres. Marta Pisces was 10 centimetres. So, at the moment, synchrotron has all we've got. So, I'd like to conclude by just saying that science is about discovery. There's many new things still out there to discovery. There's a lot of new technology that's becoming available, which means that we can go back and look at previous discoveries and actually find more information. And today, it's really important to communicate and work with different people. So currently, I'm working in a chemistry department. 
John is at the Natural History Museum in Los Angeles. Gavin Young is a paleontologist at ANU in the geology department. And Tim Senden is uh, a physicist working on uh, the CT scanning. So, six in the fossil record can actually give us some important insights into behaviour, population makeup, and our own history. We've now discovered that we've not only got three dimensional bone preservation, but also muscle preservation, and that bacteria aren't the enemy. They're actually helping the mineralization and preservation of this bone. And um, we now know that uh, the Go Go Reef wasn't quite as um, exciting as as it seems, um, or environmentally pristine. There were periods where it lost oxygenation, and that was how we've got this wonderful preservation. So thank you all for attending today, and I'd particularly like to thank Michael Siverson um, from the Western Australian Museum for access to um, specimens, Paul Taffero for uh, his help with the um, scanning um, microscopy, and also my colleagues who've contributed slides for this um, talk. Thank you.